Hey everybody, this is the Monday, March 30th. Uh, is it March 30th? Yeah, um, Monday, March 30th lecture for the capstone class at Rutgers. Um, it's a short lesson. I'm going to go over it, give some examples. But I wanted to go over a few things that are happening in the class before I do. Um, so the first thing I have to mention is grades. Um, and I know I sent an email about this or an announcement. Um, I cannot really give anybody a definite number in their grades. Why? Because um, you haven't really turned anything in. Um, the project is worth 35% the website is worth 25%, that's already 60% of the grade. Another 5%, excuse me, 5% is the career services report, which I'm gonna go over how you're gonna do it now. Some people who did it already got 5%. Um, another thing is the final report, and it's another 5%. I can tell you that you're on track, how far into your website you've gotten, and I'm gonna show you that where you should be now. And also, um, how many of the assignments you've done but again that's only 10 percent. i mean you could probably miss most of the interim assignments and still get an a um so i know people who have been emailing me if there's grades i can only tell you if you're on the right track or the wrong track um and again you guys can always send me your projects to show to review them and whatever all right so i'm going to share my screen with you guys here All right, never mind this, I need to get rid of it. Okay, so we're gonna go over first thing, um, the career services, how are you gonna do the career service report? This is due on May 3rd, last class of the semester. So I've updated it. Obviously you cannot go to campus, it's not available anymore. But luckily the SCNI uh, department has someone who's agreed to meet you guys remotely and I had to change it around for anybody that already did this because some people have already done this thank you so much you've already got the five five percent of your grade um but i'm just going to go over for other people so students and again this is on their assignments do career services meeting students will be responsible for meeting with career services remotely to review and update the resume and consider prospects for internships and jobs Obviously, it's not going to be something that's going to happen in the summer, but it's something you should talk about. Um, and I might have to change the report a little bit um, when things get back to normal. When I don't know when that's going to be, but you should have an idea of where you want to apply if magically a cure happens in the summer or worst case scenario when it takes a year to get a vaccine. Uh, please read and fill out the report. Take one screenshot of your virtual meeting. So if me and you are on Zoom, take a screenshot. I want to see that that actually happened. If I have any, um, this, if I feel like maybe somebody, maybe somebody lied about it or whatever, they don't provide a screenshot, I will actually email uh, the lady and find out if you met with her or not. And you don't want to lie about that because then that gets even worse. Um, okay, moving on. This can be done anytime during, during the semester but must be turned in on the due date. You could do it next week. You could do it this week uh, once I give you the email. Here's a link to the document. Please read the document before you go have the, have the discussion with the lady. Um, her contact information is here. I'm not gonna butcher her name. That's her name there, that's her email. And I've already emailed her beforehand. She's agreed to meet with you guys all individually uh, via video chat. So please do that. Um, that doesn't change anything, um, changes a little bit. Um, moving on, all right. So remember I showed you guys this thing at the beginning of the semester where you should be. We're, tomorrow starts week nine. So week nine, your project should be 60% completed. Obviously a lot of things are going on with the corona, with COVID-19, you might not be at that, but you should be at 50%, 40 to 50% of your project. So your resume should be uploaded to your website. I'm gonna show you guys something else that I did as well. Um, and your old projects uploaded. Your project, you should have your template set up. If you're doing a website, you should have the website set up with, some, with all the tabs. If you're doing an infographic, your infographic should be set up and the first header set up. If you're doing a video, your intro should be done. Um, and things like, if you're doing a timeline, 
your timeline should be set up and you should have a few entries in it. Um, no matter what you're doing, you should have significant information. Is it possible to get this done at the last minute? Yes. But the way this works best is if you have the whole template set up and you just work on your project little by little. Those of you doing a timeline on sports, okay, this every two days on the weekend, I'm going to put two entries, three entries, whatever. Another thing that I've changed on the website, and I'm, I know I'm going into one of these and I teach two capstone classes, so both classes will see this video. Um, go to assignments. I've clarified something for you guys and made it easier to see um, on the digital uh, completed website. I know we had some discrepancies on this, but I've updated it. Everything that you should have. Home landing page, about me page, resume page, projects page, social media feeds. This was different last week. Contact info. I've gone over, you know, if you have an interest page, I've gone over maybe this might not look the same for everybody. And most importantly, I've included websites that look really good. You have the project with the yoga gram there. All these websites got 100 because they have everything in one form of another. And I just wanna show you Diana's website from last semester. She doesn't necessarily have all the tabs that I've listed on that website, but that's an aesthetic choice and that's up to you guys. So she does have it, it's just condensed. So she has her resume, LinkedIn, and the full about me on one page, that's fine. Um, any questions that you have, anything that you want me to proofread, again, it's me who's gonna give you your grade. So if you are confused, or not sure what you should add or include, just email me a link to your website and I'll tell you. Again, you should do that sooner than later. I think by the next week or two, your professional website should be done. This is easy to do. Um, this is due Friday, May 1st. No, this is due Thursday, April 30th. Up until that Tuesday, you should send me things to read. Do not send me anything on Thursday, April 30th at 5 p.m. to proofread, it will not happen. Um, but again, there's weeks to go. So um, send it to me if you want me to preview anything. And I want you guys to get a perfect grade. I want you guys to get 100. So if you're confused or you want to tweak things or make sure that everything's perfect, email me. All right, before we get into the lesson, there's a lot here. So I think a video is the easiest way than a long email. Um, okay, sorry about this. So what you're going to do for this week is once I finish with the lecture, um, you're going to watch this video. You're going to completely watch this video lecture. There's an assignment at the end and you're going to respond to two paragraphs. What did you think? How did the assignment work out for you? And that's going to count for your class participation. Everybody has to do this unless you have some problems. Yeah, I may sound kind of strict about the attendance, but if you email me that you don't have a computer because of what's going on or your family's in trouble or somebody's sick or you're sick, obviously I'm not going to be strict about it. I'm going to work with you. All right. Give me one second. So this is week um, nine. And what are we going to do for week 10? We're going to have one-on-one -on -one meetings again. So same thing we did last time. And some of you actually met with me digitally, uh, virtually, remotely. Um, so it's going to work like that. And I'm offering a time slot. So each one of you, once you see this video, head to the sign up sheet. It's under week 10. You're going to choose a slot to meet with me and you're going to call me either on Skype or FaceTime using my email, faustogpinto at gmail.com. I'm available that way. And I'm going to be waiting during that time slot because I don't have these applications on my phone, team Android. Um, I'm waiting there. And if you don't show up, I've offered a few slots. We can try to reschedule, but you should hold the meeting. Um, and also next week is the progress update too. That's due on uh, this Sunday, next Sunday. So same thing like last time, I changed it around a little to offer a lot of different slots that I'm available. Um, I'm not available at any other time than this because I teach other classes. I hold live Q and A's and so forth. Guys, just a reminder, at 3.30 or 4.30, depending on your class start time, I'm going to be available for live Q&As. If you have a lot of questions, detailed questions, take advantage of this. Um, and you're going to sign up and meet with me and call me, as it says on that. Okay. Getting into the lecture. 
Sorry, my face is in the way. So today we're talking about branding. It's not just for companies, it's also for us. It's our digital footprint. It's what we leave online on the internet. It's our Twitter pages, our LinkedIn pages, our Facebook pages, our Instagram pages. It says who we are, what we share, it talks about our friends, our colleagues, and our bosses. So I don't think I have this in the slide, but now that it's come to my mind, you wanna be careful about what you can see online. Um, a good example of this, or a bad example of this, um, is one of my family members who has an open Facebook profile and we can see that he's been liking some provocative pages on Facebook and I always make fun of him for it. Make sure somebody cannot see that stuff. Um, and moving on, we have more examples of that. So you need to start thinking of yourself as a brand. When people think or bring you up or, or name you, what do you want them to think? When they think about you, when they say your name, what type of image uh, do they uh, think in their mind. So Carlos uh, Velasquez in one of my classes, he's always talking about baseball. So already his brand is baseball. Um, if, you, if you're in my second section, you don't know him, but he's constantly talking about baseball and things like that. That's his brand. Um, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to work for the MLB. He's curated that brand and he's done so on his websites and his project and things like that. Um, what do you want to be known for? Even if you're not sure yet, what online persona do you want to be remembered as? Even in your personal space, do you want to be known as an activist, as a fashionista, somebody who's cool, somebody who's woke, somebody who's aware of a lot of things that are going on? Um, you want to start bringing that to, a, to attention and curtailing that and curating that. First thing you all should do, and if you were in my uh, DCIM uh, Digitech class, you need to Google yourself. What is coming up? Is this what you want to be known for? You may need to block certain things. You may need to contribute more to your brand. Um, so more of you pops up. So I'm actually gonna do this with you guys here. If I can get out of this presentation. And I just closed all my windows, excellent. So I'm gonna Google my name, my full name and see what comes up. And so right away, LinkedIn, you know that I'm an adjunct professor where I teach, also teach at Hofstra. My Instagram, I have an open Instagram. So I've looked through and got rid of all the posts I do not want people to see. If my boss at Rutgers goes to my Instagram page, who knows, people are bored one day, it's a suggestion. I don't want people to see anything, maybe me partying when I was traveling or something, all that stuff is gone. You see my professional photos here, and you should all do this at, at the time and at the end. What's coming up? Mug shots of people that I've taken or for stories. Um, you, I have here. These are all photos that I've either taken or used in stories that I've written. You have to do this. Something might pop up that you don't want people to see from an old. You could have a photo of you throwing up the middle finger from MySpace, and somehow it pops up here. Um, so please do this search. I haven't done this in a while, so I want to see if anything comes up that I don't want nobody to see. Let's see. Oh, I'm going to um, open this link because I want to mention this to you guys earlier. I mean, later in the lesson here. Um, it looks good. Um, why is Jon Snow, I don't know if you guys caught that, popping up for my name? Hmm, what connection doesn't appear anymore? No idea, maybe somebody with the same last name or whatever. All right. And I have to go to my drive because I mistakenly closed this, so deal with me for two seconds. Oh, I didn't even finish. Sorry, guys. So go back through my name. Let's see what else I find. Find all my articles when I worked at NJ.com, when I worked for the Hunts Point Express, my videos on Vimeo, my articles from whatever, my SoundCloud videos, my Flickr, 
by scribbed or scribed. Um, go to the next few pages, see what you have. Um, this is a company, these companies that uh, aggregate your information. They actually have my email address. Let's see what happens. And you can get rid of this. My Reuters articles, my Facebook page, my New York Times stuff, and so forth. It's just a bunch of my articles. There's nothing here that I don't want anybody to see. Um, I'm going to keep going. I've been quoted in some academic journals and books because of my articles. Um, so I think I'm good. Um, and so forth. Let's see what's this. So you have to be careful if you want to take this stuff off. You have to contact the page. Some of these websites, you when you Google yourself, you're gonna you're gonna be aggravated because you're gonna see your whole um, phone number, address, and family members. That's actually public info, so they're not doing anything illegal. And you can uh, Google how to get that off. So my Rutgers page came up fairly, fairly lately. I want my Rutgers page to be prominent because Rutgers is a great institution to teach at, especially for such a, uh, for a young professor like myself. So I have to actually tell Rutgers, and I've been saying this for a few semesters, to go in and add my middle name into, the, into my Rutgers um, faculty page. Um, but I haven't done that yet. So what steps do you guys, got, do you guys have to do uh, to audit your online presence and make it more powerful. Personal website. Everybody should have a personal website. And I'm even lacking um, because I have my old one. I need to update what I'm doing now. LinkedIn is a placeholder for that right now. But guess what? At the end of this class, all of you will have a nice looking professional website. We'll get to know who you are, what you look like, what you've studied, and what your resume is. And after class is over, you should keep it. You should update it um, as you progress in your careers. You can even might want to buy the domain, get rid of the .wix or .wordpress, and make it more professional, and so forth. So I guess I'm just going to take a cough drop here. I'm doing these online lectures all day. Um, so find ways to produce value, even if you are commenting or sharing on social media. So you can get a lot of responses and become really popular just by sharing your opinions. Um, if we talk about if there's a lot of discussion about being Latino in the New York City area, I can add my own experience and I can be known in a small community that could be influential and maybe help me get jobs. Um, but you have to provide insightful context um, and add yourself to these things. People see this and it grows your brand. All you need is really one tweet to blow up. Um, you could be seen and once a lot of people start following you, if you have a small group of people that follow you and retweet you, and those people have a lot of people, you'll get tons of retweets. And we've had people who I know that worked at the New York Times follow me. Um, I don't have that many followers. They liked my story, and even though it was a small community paper story, they retweeted it or reposted it, and I had a lot of added a lot of followers. Another way to produce value is what I mentioned before: is adding your input. Um, I cover a lot of immigration stories and issues, even though. There's not something always going on. Every time I would see other immigration stories and issues on Twitter, I would retweet it and add my opinion and what I saw in my reporting. So let's say there's a story from Los California and Los Angeles Times is a reporter that I look up to. They posted a story now it's retweeted and add, oh, in my reporting in Connecticut or New Jersey, I found that blah, 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 these, uh, this population, let's say the Guatemala population, so forth and so forth, things like that. Be purposeful, be purposeful about what you share, very important. Again, if you in my Digitech class, um, you remember the story that I told you about the lady who got on the plane, going to Africa and made a st really stupid remark about Africa. Um, you, you guys can Google that, the tweet that changed the world or the tweet that changed my life, New York Times. She was on airplane mode. When she got off the plane, she was fired. She was retweeted. She was in all these blogs and articles because she said the wrong thing a really racist uh comment so everything you send and share online is your personal brand you create you create this you are the master of you know what people see about you online and we do this in person right this is a theoretical example let's say i'm a college new jersey golf kid from new jersey but i want to be, be taken serious as a geologist 
right? I, where do I begin? How do I even start to be a, ge a geologist outside of a school setting? First things first, cut that hair or gel it down, um, buy a suit. Are there any geologist organizations that I uh, can join? Maybe there's a geologist association of New York City, the NJ Geologist Association, the Latino Professional Geologist Association, the Rutgers Ge Geologist. These are all things you should be doing and organizations that you should be channeling in to help you. Um, I was I took advantage of being part of the National Hispanic Journalist Association and got a couple opportunities out of that. Join listservs and mailings. We do this online. You should join these organizations, these Facebook groups, these LinkedIn groups, these meetup pages, and things like that. Follow people who you look who you look you look up to. Um, again, if you want to work in sports, who's somebody in the NBA, an announcer, or somebody that you look up to, even locally or or big, how did they get there? Research their career, what was their path? And there's a big discussion about, you know, some of my friends or some of my family members might be like, oh, you're a sellout, um, you know, from the Bronx, whatever, like, oh, you know, you're too professional, you don't, you don't stay with where you're from. But being professional is not taken away from who you are. In fact, you should talk about your interest online, but you should do so in professional manner. Um, people like to see that you're human and you'd be surprised at how many people um find have similar interest in you for example um sometimes during the holiday season as a puerto rican i drink uh, coquito it's an alcoholic drink like eggnog um that puerto ricans make for christmas new year's and the holiday season i'll post a picture of me drinking that and say oh it's uh puerto you know puerto rican holiday time and a lot of people that i know a hispanic journalist and puerto rican journalists or people would say oh wow What's the recipe? How did you do that? Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm not posting me drunk on the floor because I drank the coquito. Um, another example of this is if you're a hip hop fan. There's nothing wrong with being a hip hop fan in a professional setting, right? You can share cool stories, cool news, uh, songs you like. I might tweet, oh, little Uzi Vert, the new album, he came through. We were looking for it. Thank you for delivering. But I'm not going to tweet any of the lyrics because they're too uh, vulgar for a professional page. If you're a sports fan, you might tweet interesting stories, um, articles, observations, retweets, but you're not gonna say this effing team sucks. You know, if you support the Knicks, you, you might think that, but you shouldn't really say it on your professional page. Moving on, um, you have to associate with strong brands. What are the strongest brands that you have? Um, the biggest one that we all share is Rutgers. You ever tell anybody that you go to school or work at Rutgers, they say, wow, that's a big school. It's a good school. Somebody might be an alumni and help you. You'll be surprised as you guys progress in your career, just because you have went to Rutgers and you apply for a job, somebody might automatically attach to you for that shared experience. Wow, you went to Rutgers. You remember this building? Did you have this teacher? Blah, blah, blah. And they might want to, you'll get into the door. You get an interview just because of that. For example, I got both my teaching positions from my grad school Facebook group. They posted the positions. I applied, was hired. I wouldn't have even known about those positions if I wasn't part of this Facebook group. And a lot of it is junk. A lot of it is jobs I wouldn't care for, video jobs, producer jobs. But I check it out fairly often, maybe once every two weeks. You should search, search Facebook for groups, for groups like this that you can take advantage of. In that same vein, almost every job of opportunity I've gotten was because of my network. It's not to speak, to speak lightly of my skills because I had the skills. But remember, there's so many people applying for these jobs that you have to have so, sort of a personal connection. I still needed that experience to get to those places, but because of the network that I had, it got me in the door and helped me. So for example, when I interviewed to work as a, as a stringer for Reuters in Rhode Island, the editor knew me. He saw, he didn't know me, he knew people that I knew. He saw my resume that I had worked for the Bronx News Network, a small community paper, and he knew two of the journalists that were editors there. And he said, oh, do you know, uh, I would say his name, Jordan Moss. I said, yeah, he was my editor. So right away, he knows how serious that guy is. And he knows that if you worked with him, he might even send a quick email, tweet, or Facebook message to that guy to background check you on the low. Like, hey, how was uh, Pinto when he was working with you? So I honestly think that's why I was chosen, because of that connection. Another strong, other types of strong brands, any place you volunteered for, your fraternities, your sororities, 
any colleagues that you have, your organizations that you've been a part of, and things like that. Uh, you have to reinvent. Your brand is like a narrative. So reinvent yourself. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Again, tweet your interest. If, and I'm, I'm going to get real here. If your interests are s and if you don't know what that is, look it up on your own time. Maybe you want to keep that to yourself. But um, maybe that's your aspiration and you want to sell that as your brand. I know this girl who, that's what that's her job. It's S and M, and she travels. She makes a lot of money off of this. If you go to her Instagram page, you'll see all these crazy photos. But guess what? That's how she makes money. That's her brand. She's not going to apply for these office jobs that are going to look down on her. She's going to apply to people who want to hire her for this, and so they go to her page, and she's curated that image. Um, so we have to always evolve. Um, what's your next move? You know, there's a the whole COVID-19 thing threw everything out of plan, right? So what are you going to do? How are you going to adapt to that? You should start thinking about that now. This is not going to end anytime soon. And sadly, and I feel for you guys a lot, I have family members who are in college like you guys. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Even there's talk about the fall semester being online only, people cutting back, people deferring for a year. So I might even be out of a job. What am I going to do to, um, to adapt to that? Um, moving on. Um, now I'm trying to move into higher education. I was a journalist. What brands, groups of people can help me? How can I get to the next level? So are there any professional Latino academic, uh, faculty organizations? Are there any people that I know that were journalists that are now working in academia that are, that want to hire me or can give me advice? Um, and when you meet people, you should always reach out to them and say, Hey, you know, can I have coffee with you? This actually helps a lot because, you know, maybe then they're not hiring now, but to see that you're, that, that you're so, if they see you're so interested in, in what they do or how they've got there, they'll take an interest in you and they'll keep you in their, in your mind. They'll have you in their mind. And if something comes up, they'll say, Hey, I know this young person who's really interested, who's, who's thoughtful and whatever. You always need to think of yourself as an asset. If you're at your internship, if you're at your job, even if you work at McDonald's or whatever, not to speak down of that, but wherever you work, you should not only think of yourself as another employee, but an asset. What do you bring to the table that nobody else brings? Why does the company need you? And how will they suffer without you? Um, and you bring something others don't, and you can do this anywhere. So those skills are transferable. If you're a good server at Applebee's, you might, you could be, an excellent server at one of the top end restaurants in Manhattan. You know, people make lots of money doing that, by the way. We have to be a little bit selfish in a way, and I'll tell you, we'll, get, we'll deviate from this a little bit. But for now, you have to think of yourself as the me, Inc. We are all CEOs on our own companies. I wasn't just a reporter for the Connecticut Post. I was a reporter with these special skills, and they needed me, right? I had to have this attitude. Don't be arrogant, but I have these skills. If I leave, who's going to do this? Nobody. You know, they will come up with somebody, but for the time being, you're powerful. Um, the, and I could transfer these skills anywhere. I showed the, I showed off these skills to others while doing my job, especially with Twitter and Instagram. Um, I was the first to get to breaking new scenes. I would get there so quick. I want to show you this example from when I worked at NJ.com. So this lady, there was a guy who was from New Jersey who had a, who did a mass shooting in the Fort Lauderdale airport. And this is his aunt. He lived with her. I got there so quick. It was just me and one other guy. We got there before the FBI and before all the other reporters. We got an exclusive interview. Um, the FBI knocked on the door and kicked us out and told us we were going to get arrested if we didn't leave. But guess what? Nobody else had this interview, just me and this other guy. So I was good at, you know, getting there quickly. Um, making sense of things quickly. You know, this is a tough job. These are complex situations. And I have to simplify them to people so that they can understand it. Um, and I can do that fairly quickly. Um, it's chaos in these scenes. There's a fire going on. Who's going to give me information? Who, is anybody hurt? And I, you know, over time got adapted to who to, who to talk to. If the people didn't want to give me information, people recognize me. They would give me information off the record. And I was adapted at sending photos and video. Um, I would always be there, like I said, first. And 
other news organizations would message me, hey, I want to use your photos and video. Sorry, I work for this company and you can. And it was just in the small area, right? It was just in the small city of Connecticut. But NJ.com saw that I could do that on a bigger scale and trench to that. And when I worked for the New York Times, they saw that I could do that on a city scale. So we have to think about why me? Why do we trust? Who do we trust in an online environment? Why should people trust you? There's so many people like you. There's so many people who want to work in, not to put you guys down, in ITI, in journalism, in public relations. There's so many uh, online websites to visit. Why should I visit your brand? What authenticity do you bring? So when I worked in Bridgeport, Connecticut as a breaking news reporter, theoretically, I would say I want to visit Fausto's Twitter because he's always on the scene first when something happens. He knows what's going on even before the article's put together because that's a reporter's job. We're tweeting now before the articles are put out. And they know that I'm a trusted source because I'm connected to the Connecticut Post and I'm not just a random person. These are students in my last class and I use them as examples. Um, I'm going to check out Brandon's YouTube because he's got good reviews on electric skateboards. Um, one of my other students last semester, he was selling sneakers. So we use this example, why am I gonna visit his sneaker seller page as, as opposed to others? He's got good prices, he doesn't have any fakes and things like that. So in whatever you do, you have to think about why should they visit you? Why you, why me? So the readings also talk about the future benefit model where people will pay more to shop at higher end department stores, excuse me, like Barney's and Nordstrom for the personalized experience. What's your future benefit model? Why should people pay more attention to you? What do you offer? Show off, I mentioned this to you guys before, what are you most proud of? Brag about it. And I've said this so many times, the Dean's List. Um, and the career services told me this. Throughout my whole four years undergrad, I made the Dean's List once. They said, guess what? Put it on your resume. You made the Dean's List. And I'm not lying about it. I didn't say consecutive. It just says Dean's List. If you guys were ever on the Dean's List, guess what? Add it to your resume. Um, I only worked for the New York Times for a few months and a few assignments. But guess what? I brag about it. Hey, I worked for the New York Times. I had my name in the New York Times newspaper, which is the holy grail of journalism. Um, but I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not, it's not going to say in my resume that I was a full-time staff reporter. I would, no way was, and I was nowhere even close to that. Um, so you, you can brag, but don't lie. You don't want to get caught in a lie. Um, yeah, moving on. How to market yourself. If you don't have much, start small in what you like. So we're gonna use another journalism example. Um, you start writing locally. I didn't start writing for the New York Times. I didn't start as a stringer for the New York Times. I started locally, community newspapers, small niche publications connected with uh, CUNY where I attended. And I built my way up from there. You have to start small to market yourself. How this works in the digital age is that you start getting more online presence and your score, your search goes up, even for those small articles because they're online now. Um, how you communicate also speaks value, volume, uh, volumes about you. Are you always willing to help? Um, when, the New York, when I was a stringer at the, at the New York Times, almost every time they called me, I was like, I'm going. I don't care how far I was, what, what I was in the middle of doing. One time I was in T-Mobile getting a new cell phone and the lady was pissed at me because, you know, they get paid off the activation. I was like, I'm out of here. I have to go. Sorry. I, I really apologize, but I need to go. Some, my, um, unfortunately, when I was in grad school during this time and one of my professors who did, I did not get along with told me if I miss any more class, I'm in danger of failing and not graduating. So I did have to turn down some assignments, um, but they knew I was always willing there to help when I could. Do you respond quickly? If somebody's going to email you, are you going to respond right away? Are you reliable? If uh, somebody at your internship sends you an email, are you going to check it two days later? Or are you going to check it within half an hour? And all of this stuff puts you up ahead of a lot of people. One of the things that you can do to stand out and promote your online self is offline. It's free business cards. Um, I have an old example somewhere around here. Maybe this draw. Sorry, it's probably one of my bookmarks. Um, let me see if I can show you guys that. Yep. So here's my first business card that I had. Um, I got it for free on Vistaprint, and I gave you guys this website. 
So basically you have an address, kind of cheesy newspaper stack, whatever. Nobody had business cards. Um, and a lot of people that are trying to make impressions at career fairs and things, maybe they're going to forget everybody that's there, but if they dig in their pocket and they only have one business card, they're going to remember you more often. Um, it also was a good way for me since I worked at community papers for sources to have my email reach out to me with stories that worked really well. And you can pay extra, but you can get a stack of free business cards. It just has the logo on the back. Um, you can pay extra to remove that. 200 cards, as you can tell, I still have some of them. This was from probably eight years ago. So I encourage you guys to all do this and set yourselves apart. It looks very professional. It's cheap, it's easy, um, and it makes a lasting impression. What's your power? What power do you have? Um, my power was I could simplify complex immigration issues to show how it affects communities. This is hard stuff. They're always changing little laws here and there. Um, and it's not easy. If you don't understand the basics, you're not going to understand the change in the, in the, in the smaller laws. Um, and I act as, a act as a leader in what you put forth. You know, I'm a leader in uh, relaying to you the changes in immigration law and using voices, which local voices, which are not easy to find. If you ever have to, have to um, interview undocumented immigrants, it's not an easy thing. Um, so yeah, act as a leader, but make sure you know what you're saying. Make sure you're truthful, you have info to back it up and things like that. So although I mentioned all about the Me Inc., there's this thing of loyalty and you should be a team player. Although you have to act selfishly to brand yourself, you need to make sure you're a part of a team when needed to be. You should shout out your coworkers. Does your coworker do, um, does your coworker put out a good article? Um, does your co did your coworker win an award, uh, did a good job? Retweet people. So I had an internship one time where I worked for a very famous journalist. Um, I did, it didn't really work out. Um, and uh, the first time we did a big story on some political campaign stuff, I honestly don't really care about politics, especially small politics. And the people in there were like, yeah, we got the scoop. We interviewed this person, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember who the guy was, somebody from Queens. And I was like, eh, it's nothing for me. And the guy I was interning for, he passed away, so RIP. Um, he got really pissed. He's like, oh, you're not proud that I put you on that story. You didn't even have the courage to retweet it. So in situations like that, what's a retweet going to do? You know, I should have just retweeted it. Another example is being in school. Maybe there's somebody you don't like in class, but guess what? You all work in these very niche, you all are aspiring to work in these very niche fields. Um, so example, for example, when I was in grad school, I didn't like most of the other students. Um, we were from very different backgrounds. We didn't get, a, we didn't get along. Um, I was always just kind of to myself. And I did, I did have a close group of people that I was with. My professors, sometimes I, I honestly felt that I had more experience than them because I was in grad school working for the New York Times and other companies. Um, and they were just in school, my professor told me, hey, stop being that way. You need to be careful. They might be your coworkers or editors someday, so play nice. So I kind of toned it down, whatever. Um, and years, not even five years, four years, three years later, these people started to assign. They started to be editors at top media companies. And you could see how, let's say, let's say theoretically next year, we, they don't open school, this enrollment, the enrollment is low. And I have to go back to journalism, right? I need to start thinking, honestly thinking about that because it could happen. And I apply for a job where one of my fellow students works um, and they ask about me or even worse, as an editor, they say, hey, no, he was an asshole when, when we were students. So don't be that way. I've come a long way from that. I'm not like that anymore. Um, but that's just a good example of your brand and uh, keeping up with it. So four things for the future you need to remember. You've got to be a great teammate and a supportive colleague. You've got to be an exceptional expert at something that has real value. Did we ever talk about real value? Um, if we didn't, I'll go into it really quickly. So real value is, let's say, I know a lot about immigration stories. And I was writing about immigration before Trump and all the immigration issues became popular. 
so I know a lot about it um, and that had real value once all that stuff sort of gained a lot of um, exposure in the media. Fake value, I'll use my grandpa. My grandpa's an expert on alien sightings, UFOs, uh, killer whales, and jungle stories because he watches TLC all day, those corny shows. Um, that's not real value. Um, and I, I know some of the sports people might get mad, but some we all know somebody who's an expert at a sport that they have no value in. Um, they're, maybe they play fantasy <laughs> fantasy uh, football um that they maybe win a couple bucks but you know um it's not really real value it's not going to get them anywhere in life as opposed to somebody like again sorry carlos that i keep mentioning you um he knows everything about baseball because he aspires to baseball he has an internship there um that's real value for him for me anything that i mentioned to you about baseball has no real value to me and this uh, jumps from person to person um, you've got to be a broad gauge visionary. You have to be a leader, a teacher, a farsighted ima imagineer. You have to imagine things. You have to be a leader and, you know, think about what's coming up in the future. Adjust for those changes. And you've got to be a business person. You've got to be, a, but at the same time, you have to, you've got to become obsessed with realistic outcomes. Um, uh, here's an example from one of the projects from last semester. Guy, one of my students in my class, wanted to do a crowdfunding site. Um, he wanted to raise money for uh, youth baseball in Nicaragua. Very good project, whatever. Um, but he wasn't realistic with the outcomes. He thought that he could easily message Models, Sports Authority, MLB. He could thought he could just tweet them and they were going to send lots of money. Or they were going to even retweet him. And I told him, Listen, that's not going to work. I know from being a reporter, these companies have HR. They have all these rules. It's going to take you forever and not a semester to get in contact with them. And they're just going to sh shoo you off if you're a student. And he didn't really raise a lot of money. I told him to go small. Go to the baseball shop in your town. Go to your fraternity. Go to a league nearby, baseball team like that. Start small, those retweets and stuff. He didn't listen and he had unrealistic outcomes. Same thing with your career. You, you know, we all see these for me, for, I would take, for example, um, even when I was in grad school, there were, there were these undergrads that were, who were staff reporters at the New York Times, the New York Times and staff reporters at the New York Times, um, at that point were getting paid 85,000 a year. Um, now they're getting paid like 114 thousand dollars a year which is insane for a reporter um and i was making 50 50 dollars an article and it was an unrealistic outcome to think that i could easily jump even as a stringer even as as me knowing um a, a few editors and other reporters one of my um mentors and editors a former boss told me you know i know stringers who have worked for new york times for 10 years waiting to get hired and it never happened so you really have to be realistic with your expectations. And sometimes that can be, you know, downputting, but um, you have to do that. Sorry, my phone is ringing in the background. That's why I'm pausing. Um, all right. So here's something that I want you guys to do. Um, also, for the discussion, I want you to write two paragraphs. What do you think about this? Did anything pop up to your mind? Um, and so forth. So I want you to take two minutes and in 15 words, write down what is your brand. So you can write it in your phone, you can write it in a paper, do this, leave the paper aside. Once you have your brand, I want you to Google your full name. So for people who have a common name, a really common name like John Rodriguez or whatever, you're gonna to wanna to put your name in Rutgers or New Jersey. What did you find? um did did what you find match to your brand what you listen so let's say i put my brand as journalist turned professor and as you've guys seen from my my google search that's what you'll find but if it what was it that what if it was something else what if it was a traveler like i have a lot of travel stuff and also very important did you find anything that you shouldn't have online um, did you have a photo of you kissing on a high school boyfriend or at a house party chugging beers? Did you have a mean tweet that you wrote? You should all go through your Twitter. You know, who knows? 
is the sports guys. We mentioned this in class. People pulling up old racist tweets that they had or old tweets that were wrong from years ago and people getting in deep trouble. So spend some time and do that and tell me what you guys find in the discussion. Um, I look forward to having our one-on-ones with you next week. I'm very pleased by the progress that everybody's taking and I understand the difficulties that everybody's having with now, having now with what's going on. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Um, I don't think anybody's in a really bad place, but you just have to keep it up. Um, talk to you guys soon.